who makes good engineers? If you had to go somewhere, probably mechanical engineering especially, there's probably a lot to be learned before you get to school. Mostly it's who are the problem solvers? Who can solve problems? But I'm gonna offer kids that grow up on farms, and I don't mean the big industrial farms where everything's automated and you, if someone says, I'm gonna save you 20% on this thing, and that 20% is more than your yearly salary. So you can't afford the other 80%. Hello everyone, time for another, uh, we're in the middle of our autonomy series production. And so just taking a little break from that and I wanted to get a short one out on who makes good engineers. If you had to go somewhere and pick some folks out, what pool of people would you be more successful in? And it's an important question. You know, in the military, we know that something over 70% of the people who fight for the country are from the Southern L. That's Texas through Florida, up to North Carolina. That's where most of the people that fight our wars come from. So just asking the same question on engineering. So probably gonna be a lot of biases from the audience on this one, I'm, I'm sure. You know, everybody likes to think of home as the best place to get people, but let's back up from that and think about where does, you know, what are the right culture traits? What are the culture traits we're looking for? What is, what type of character are we looking for or is necessary? And it might depend on the type of engineering you're doing. Some types of engineers may fit better from one culture to the next. So there's probably no one single culture or state or county or region of the country where all engineers should come from. Not, not saying that at all, because that's not probably very likely not true. But there are some life experiences that will help you, especially if you're going into some sort of engineering field, like probably something like certainly electrical engineering, probably mechanical engineering, especially. There's probably a lot to be learned before you get to school about topics in mechanical engineering. Electrical engineering as well, but probably from a skill point of view, there aren't too many people doing electrical engineering tasks at home before they go to college. But that's but that's got to have a qualifier on it too, because you know there the technology that's available today commercially and the prices you can buy it at that's been more possible than ever. If I just look at the Nvidia work, I can buy their processors, their GPUs, already packaged up and suitable for connections to peripherals. It's almost like a Heath kit. If you remember Heath kits, that's a long time ago, but if you remember Heath kits, those were science projects you could order, or at least engineering projects you could order online. Not online, but out of a catalog. And you could get those, build a television, a radio, whatever, and that's on steroids now. So. We shouldn't really say that we can't get electrical engineering experience prior to college. You can certainly get software experience, but we talked about software experience and mechanical engineering experience, but mostly it's who are the problem solvers? Who can solve problems on their own, just grind it out, go from one trial to another, one thought process to another, and accept the world for how it is, and then for that knowledge, what can you do with the world to get the effects results you're looking for against a set of goals? Where's that group at? So that as well might be scattered, but I'm gonna offer kids that grow up on farms, and I don't mean the big industrial farms where everything's automated and you call in you know, people to harvest 12,000 acres. You've seen, most people have probably seen the combines that come through and it's just a service you buy. You're not doing all the farming. In other words, you're not touching all the pieces of it. And so why do I, so I, so I wanna to try to exclude them in some way. There's still plenty of hands-on work to do on a farm, even if someone's harvesting all your crops for you. I'm not saying that's not true, but if you're that big of an operation, you're probably hiring a lot of that out. So I wanna just refer to the people who probably have, you know, 200 to a thousand acres, something like that. You really can't go, you just can't afford to have other people do your work for you. You just can't afford that if you're gonna keep any money. So back in the 50s and 60s, a farmer with 300 acres could put two kids through school and college. That's sort of how the money worked out. But today, I'm sure that's probably several thousand acres, maybe more than 10,000 acres before anything like that's possible. So if you're under a thousand acres, you're probably doing a lot of work yourself. And what's that mean? Well, 
what work are you doing? Well, you go do all of it. And you might get, get a hand here and there, you know, takes two people to run a hay elevator. You can't do that by yourself. Uh, you can, but you're going to get behind. So you might get some hired help, hourly help. And a lot of times guys that size will help each other out. You know, one week helping one guy, another week helping another guy. Kind of how it goes. So you have to learn how to develop relationships. Think of that. You have to learn how to work with people where they're actually get, taking their time and giving you labor in exchange for you doing something for them. Unheard of, right? That's a unique skill. The more I look around, the more I think that is a very unique skill. So you have to be able to work with people. And then, like everything else, the point of farming is to, you know, on a smaller farm, thousand acres and below, might not be all profit driven. Might be uh, a little bit of hobby going on there. So that has its own reward. So that means that you're, you can get some happiness and satisfaction out of actually doing work and completing work. Okay good trait to have for an engineer, then you have to understand the business side of what you're doing. And farming, everything's connected together. It's all connected together. It is truly a system engineering problem. It is absolutely a system engineering problem. You need to understand what the cost of fertilizer is going to be. You need to understand for a fertilizer application, how much yield you're going to get. For instance, on alfalfa, you can double your size, you can double your haul on weight on alfalfa if you double the potash you put on. Potash might be $15 a ton, That's, so it gets expensive. So you have to be very careful on how to maximize your results against what the market forces are. And then for whatever product you're raising, people do corn and beans here in Ohio, but there's a lot of other types of farming that I'm not aware of, and I'm absolutely sure they work the same way. You, all your activities that take time and money have to be optimized the best you can. And then a lot of times you're making guesses, especially when it comes to the weather. But that has to be optimized against your return on investment. And uh, also in farming, there's lots of things to say here. I won't keep us too long. But in small farming, you learn the difference between percentage and absolute numbers. If someone says, I'm going to save you 20% on this thing. And that 20% is more than your yearly salary. So you can't afford the other 80%. So, you know, you really learn the difference there. You learn how to see through things. Things will be represented away. And when you work through it, especially the more experience you get, you'll find out that, uh, yeah, it's not being represented in a way that's uh, advantageous to you. So you have to be able to figure that stuff out. And I think a lot of engineers have that trait. They're able to do that kind of thing. So that's very important. One example. So there's lots of seminars that the implement dealers put on, you know, selling new equipment. And that's good. Everybody needs to refresh. Unless you're small enough, you need to just keep fixing and borrowing. And, but they'll have seminars. And one of the seminars I recall was they were selling disc binds. That's a way to cut hay and have it dry very quickly. They use some edged rollers that break all the stems and then the stems, the juice and the stems dry out quicker and you can get it in a barn quicker. And the way they tell the story is here in Ohio, it rains every four days in the summer and hay, hay making weather. It's going to rain every four days. So you go out there with your old equipment, cut it day one. All right. You got the field cut. Now it's laying there drying. And then you go out on day two. If it's was a night hot sunny day and you didn't get too much dew the night before and then you turn that over with a rake now you you're drying the back side of it and of course the dew will mess you up because it sucks up into the back side but let's say you don't have too much dew the next day you go you get a spreader so what that's going to do it's a different kind of rake that just throws throws the hay all over the place so you get rid of this row and you just turn it into a mat covers up the field. Okay, now you're three days drying. On average, rains every four days. So now you're three days drying and odds are it's going to rain the next day and you can't put up wet hay. It'll rot. So your whole field's at risk and maybe your whole winter supply of hay is at risk and that's important because that's how you're feeding all your livestock. So you see the interconnectivity parallels between engineering and farming. Everything's connected. So when we derive our requirements, we tend to derive them in silos. They all look like branches and they go straight down like a pyramid, whatever, branch out. But one of the things we see a lot is that we don't cross connect those requirements. Everything affects everything else at some time or another, depending on use cases that you get involved in or anomalies that occur. Everything impacts everything else. And farming is a great way 
to really at a very practical unforgettable level understand that and so so there's a lot of examples here another criteria just wrap this up real quick another criteria is it's a very dangerous profession it's a very it's very dangerous work it takes absolutely very little mistakes to either kill yourself or have serious amputations and so no one wins in that situation family doesn't win you don't win nothing extended family doesn't win so i would say farm kids with all their fingers and toes been doing it for more than six years probably pretty good candidates for engineering there's obviously professions that pay more than engineering but with engineering you'll generally always have a home you can raise a family you'll probably have some money when you're done and you can decide what you want to do with that but just wanted to leave that thought i think that's maybe overlooked i think maybe Silicon Valley just might be a little overrated as a single source of brilliant engineers. You still have to have that intelligence component to make all that practical experience work for you. But there's plenty of those around. So I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. Not claiming there's any exclusivity there, but I am claiming that when we look for employee bases, when we look for resourcing and we start looking at resumes and we start asking about people's past and what they like doing and what their hobbies are. We might want to stick an engineering lens on there and say, hey, is are those things that happened, you know, in our own mind, are those things that this person went through make him a better and him or her a better engineer? A lot of girls running farms too. It's not like if you were doing subsistence farming, it girls would still be doing it, but they'd be doing different things. Because everybody's got to pitch in in certain areas because it's, you know, you're just surviving. But if you're not doing that, then everybody's uh, eligible. I think it's I think it's important. So whatever it turns out to be for you, I don't know if farm kids think that way, get trained that way. I don't know if a lot of them like to go be doctors or lawyers or those are professions that can make more money. But then again, money's not the whole thing. And if they're used to getting satisfaction from doing things and seeing things work and be successful because they took care of a thousand different parameters the correct way and every year they got better at it, that might be very good engineering stock. So just want to throw that out there. Like I say, we're in the middle of our autonomy series and just want to take a break from that and think about how that next episode is going to go. And this topic came up and so I thought I'd share a few of those thoughts. All right, everybody have a great one.